when we think of diversity in science or in academia in general even if there is no just for the argument sake there is no measurable outcome still i think it is our duty to make sure that this world is a safe habitable place for everyone no one should feel threatened welcome to this podcast series from the international science council where we're exploring diversity in science I'm Marnie Chesterton, and in this episode, we'll be looking at representation and visibility. We'll be hearing how important it is to be able to express the whole of your identity in a safe and welcoming environment, where you can see allies and other people who are like you. And we'll look at the role of organisations in fostering these spaces in science, including through explicit statements of support, which really can make a difference. We're starting by going to Antarctica. I can spend two or three months on a ship living amongst the icebergs, looking at what lives on the bottom of the sea. And one of the really exciting things is being able to discover new species. So probably about 10 to 20 percent of what we find is brand new to science. This is Dr Hugh Griffiths from the British Antarctic Survey. I work in mostly the polar regions. A marine biographer is someone who looks at where animals live and why they live there, so why they're distributed in some places and maybe not found in other places, for example. Hugh is also involved with the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research, or SCAR, which is a thematic organisation of the International Science Council. So the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research, or SCAR as it's called, which sounds like a Bond villains kind of name, actually has been sort of a huge part of my career. So early on, I was involved with scientific projects that were led by other people within SCAR. And today, I am the co-chair of one of the biology programmes within the organisation, but also I'm on all sorts of other committees and things as well. So for me, it's a brilliant way of networking with international colleagues. And because Antarctica is such a huge place where no one country could do all the research, you do need to connect up with other nationalities. And SCAR is that kind of ideal way of both meeting new friends and colleagues and for helping to get brand new collaborations that help answer some really big questions. According to Hugh, this need for collaboration within polar research means it's home to a very diverse community of scientists in all senses of the word. All sciences are covered in Antarctica. We've got engineering, we've got biology, we've got atmospheric sciences, we've got all these different things. And so it's a melting pot for different types of science as well as different types of people. And because it's so international, you've already got to deal with lots of different cultural backgrounds anyway. So it's not a huge step for us to move on to include things like sexuality, gender or um, disability, for example. Indeed, on the 18th of November, the International Day of LGBTQIA plus people in STEM, the polar research community got together for the first Polar Pride Day. We put out a load of things on social media and thought it'll be a few pretty pictures and people, you know, with rainbows and penguins and things. But actually, there were some really heartfelt comments in some of the things that came back to us, like people saying that the fact that we'd given out pins and badges to senior members of staff to wear that showed that they were allies meant that there were people staying within polar research because they finally found a place where they felt welcome and safe. Something as simple as a badge can go a long way to making people feel secure that science workplaces or conferences are a safe space where they're welcomed and accepted. The importance of creating environments like this within science can't be overstated. Unless any, any person feels safe, feel welcome, how do we expect that we will get the best out of those people? So I think it is very important, whether it is a lab, it is any institute, it is any organization, we need to make the place safe. And in this particular context, just making it a safe place is not enough because there are, you know, lots of taboos that is associated with it. So that's why it is very important to explicitly mention that we don't care what sexuality, what gender expression you are, we are open to you. So this explicit statement is important in this context. That's Avijit Majumda, 
Associate Professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering at the Indian Institute of Technology in Bombay and part of the Global Young Academy, an affiliate member of the ISC. The purpose of uh, Global Young Academy is to make the voice of young academicians heard, both in terms of improving the quality of the life of the researchers, quality of science, as well as interaction between science and society. We look into how, as an young investigators, we can contribute towards the society. Within the GYA, Avijit is co-leading an initiative that works towards creating a safe space for people to discuss discrimination faced by LGBTQIA+, and other minority groups within academia. I was inducted to Global Young Academy in 2018. So in 2018, when we were inducted, and then in the first AGM annual meeting, we found that There is no group or no incubator, no working group is there, which is kind of addressing this issue of gender expression and sexuality. Our first goal is just to let the new people, new members know that this is a safe place and they can express themselves. Their gender expression and their sexuality will not be judged, rather it will be embraced. We are trying to at least to make this mark in the Global Young Academy that, okay, it's a safe place. That has included adding new language to the Academy's public statements on diversity. The statement says that how Global Young Academy is open to all various different kind of race, colour, etc, etc, gender, etc. But however, the explicit mention of sexuality and gender expression, these were not present in that diversity statement. So then we kind of brought up this topic and it was again very heartily accepted and then now it is part of our diversity statement. Statements on diversity by international organisations such as the ISC and the GYA have an important role to play in showing support, breaking down barriers and ultimately sowing the seeds for change. They need to increase the awareness, first of all, but also to get actively involved with the national academies and to ask them, get them into the discussion table and Uh, I mean, whether the government will follow that or not, that is obviously a very different question. But at least if the National Science Academies, they put pressure on their respective government to at least to start with, to at least legalize the gender expression and various forms of sexualities. I think that will be a great start. Having an explicit statement on openness and diversity can be a useful starting point. One of the five key missions of the ISC is to defend the free and responsible practice of science. This principle is reflected in all of the ISC's policies and operational guidelines, and they have a dedicated committee to oversee this. Commitments like this are particularly important for scientists who need to travel and collaborate in different settings, which may be less accessible than their usual places of work, or even unsafe. Sometimes you just need some guidelines and help from people who've been through these experiences or who are disadvantaged to help set up different ways of working. For example, the new ways of working in in the pandemic have really helped us to show that disabled people can attend conferences or work remotely on fieldwork and things because we've had to set up different ways of communicating and we should bring them forward with us even when hopefully coronavirus is long behind us to show that we can actually change the way we work so that we don't stop doing things in countries where it may be illegal to be gay, but that we allow people to attend or participate in events there where they feel safe, whether it's through safe spaces or actually just remote attendance, for example. But it is hugely impactful on people's careers. That is something where if conference organisers and things are made aware, then that can all be fed into guidelines and make people within science a lot more comfortable. And even just knowing that somebody's thought about it even if the solution is not perfect, will make you feel as if you're part of a community where things are at least being considered and they're doing their best for you. For organisations like the ISC, the freedom to participate in science is something that needs to be reasserted continually in the face of barriers. 
And that also means recognising that people may experience different types of discrimination that intersect. It is really important that we recognise things like intersectionality or developing nations or countries where people don't have the same rights and freedoms as we do. And we learn from each other's experiences because I'm a cisgendered white male. So my experience as a gay man in science is very different to a black female LGBT person, for example. I don't have a whole bunch of other barriers. I have quite a bit of privilege. So although I can recognise where I may be disadvantaged, actually I can't speak for everybody in the community. Diversity and inclusion is about making science accessible for each and every person. And by doing that, all of science stands to gain. It's very important that we open the doors to everybody to have a voice. And if those voices are heard, then it'll be better for everybody. If you make a nicer working environment or a more friendly place to be, everybody benefits. So it's not a pie where if I have my slice, you'll get a smaller slice. It's something where if I'm happier, then other people don't have to put up with me being miserable. So it's a win-win. The ISC's Committee for Freedom and Responsibility in Science is currently re-examining and re-articulating what scientific freedom and responsibility means for the 21st century, including when it comes to equal access to the scientific endeavour and its benefits for all. More information about this work and about the ISC members and networks mentioned in this podcast is available online at council.science. Next week, we'll be talking to two early career researchers about the importance of democratising knowledge and access to tools, data and infrastructure, and how, as well as securing basic human dignity, it can also support different routes into science for people from diverse backgrounds.